Time for you to rethink. You know the word annihilate? It means reduced to nothing. Perished means killed. We know what perished means. Welcome, and thanks for joining us for Rethinking Hell Live, where evangelical Christians discuss what the Bible says about hell and put conventional and controversial views to the test. Join the discussion in YouTube's live chat or email your feedback, questions, and episode suggestions to live at rethinkinghell.com. Rethinking Hell is on Facebook as well, and be sure to check us out on Patreon if you'd like to become a supporter of the show. See the description below for all links and details, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel for future updates. Well, hello. Uh, welcome to another episode of Rethinking Hell Live. My name is Chris Date, and uh, I'm really excited to share today's episode with you. Um, this pa the past few days pre preparing for it um, has been something of a... Um, I mean, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a bit of a breakthrough uh, for me on the topic that we're going to be covering today. So we'll get to that in a second. Just want to give my usual reminder that we are entirely donation funded. We do not sell merchandise, at least not yet. Our channel is not monetized, at least not yet. We don't sell ads to advertisers on our website, at least not yet. <clears throat> so we'd like to continue to be able to um, not uh, have to advertise or earn money in those ways so if you appreciate what we do here at rethinking hell whether you're a conditionalist like us or whether you're a believer in eternal torment or universalism and and appreciate our desire to um move to, to encourage the larger evangelical community to debate this topic in a way that treats each other like uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, or if for any other reason you appreciate what we do here at Rethinking Hell, we would very much appreciate your financial support. Um, you can make a one-time or recurring donation by going to RethinkingHell.com and clicking on the PayPal button there, or by going to Patreon.com slash RethinkingHell where one of these days when all of us who are very busy have time to uh, create perks for patrons, uh, pa Patreon will be a little bit more useful at that time. Um, if you don't want to financially support us, totally fine, but would very much appreciate your prayer. Um, and also uh, share our videos, share our content on social media. Um, that's a big help. It draws attention to our uh, to our ministry. Um, and also one thing that you can do to help us um, to be benefited by YouTube's various algorithms is to click the like button. Um, if you the little thumbs up icon, if you appreciate what you see today. Uh, so Subscribe to the channel if you're not already and click that notifications bell to get notifications anytime we schedule uh, upload, uh, schedule a live stream, start a live stream, or upload new content. Uh, all three of those actions, as well as watching to till the end of today's episode, all four of those actions uh, help our channel to benefit from the um, uh, to benefit from the um, YouTube algorithms. So we'd very much appreciate your support in those ways, even if you can't support us financially. To answer your question, Jonathan, in the chat, um, we may monetize our channel one day um, so as to be able to take advantage of Super Chats. We know how convenient and useful that is for people. The problem is it also opens us up to ads and um, we're reluctant to uh, to do that yet. We don't, we don't want to uh, have ads in our content, at least not yet. So, um, you know, maybe one day, and, and I'm sure that one day we'll sell, um, uh, we'll, we'll sell merchandise. You know, we, we've, we've had a mug before um, that we've given out at conferences or uh, bookmarks. We've got a variety of different things that maybe we could open up a store for, but um, we're, all, we're all volunteers and we've all got a lot going on in our lives. Um, uh, and as has been clear over the past couple episodes of the show, the things that are going on my on my on in my life are not just wearing at my time; they're also wearing at my emotions. So, uh, you know, one of these days when when um, God is a little bit more um, uh, when when it doesn't when he doesn't have me as going through as trying of a time right now, I may be able to put some some work toward that. Anyway, I'm starting to ramble. 
Um, let me tell you what we're going to do today. So uh, we have been doing an, um, an asynchronous series um, or, or a uh, periodic series in Rethinking Hell Live. What I mean by that is um, it's not like a series where they're all immediate one after the other. Um, I'll do one, I'll come back to it, uh, or I'll do one, and then I'll go on to other things, I'll come back to it, I'll go back to other things, I'll come back to it, All right. So it's it's every once in a while I come back and do this this series. And the series is called Conditionalists in History. And uh, I want to begin by explaining why I think um, this this ongoing study that I've been doing and sharing with you guys is useful. Um, you know, we we at, uh, at at Rethinking Hell are all Protestants. We're all conservative evangelicals. Um, all of which is to say that we don't. Our our ultimate authority isn't church tradition or a magisterium or a you know bishop's consensus or anything like that that you might find in Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy uh, or in pseudo Christian cults like the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. Um, we're we're Protestants and we're evangelicals, and so our ultimate authority is the Scriptures, the uh, infallible or to some of us inerrant uh, Word of God. However. We also recognize that the Holy Spirit, as recorded in that scripture, has promised to distribute gifts, spiritual gifts, to his people throughout the church age. Um, some of those gifts include teaching, and some of those gift giftees, some of those people to whom God gives the gift of teaching, are themselves gifts, the gift of teachers, to the church. And we accept that this has been something um, throughout all... That's a really good idea, Susan, to put, put those links in the description. I'll, I'll try to do that soon. Um, but anyway, God has been at work in that way all throughout church history, teaching and guiding his people. Um, and as such, I think it is the height of folly to disregard, dismiss, ignore what 2,000 years of Christians have been saying about the topic of hell um, and treat it as if, you know, it's, it's totally superfluous. We can ignore it and just go to the Word as if we don't bring to the Word our biases, our presuppositions, and so forth. No, we, 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 want, we recognize that we stand on the shoulders of giants, and we want to um, let that history, the, the, the teachings of those biblical giants, not biblical, those Christian giants throughout history, uh, we want we want to let them inform um, how we understand the text of scripture and the conclusions that we come to. Not fal not infallibly. The, the, the church tradition is not infallible. Again, we're Protestants. We believe that's only scripture. However, it's, let me put it this way. The doctrine of sola scriptura does not say scripture is the only authority. That's a mistake. That's a myth. The doctrine of sola scriptura says that scripture is the only infallible authority for faith and practice in the church. But tradition and church history is authoritative, just not as much so as scripture. Now, what does that lead me to conclude personally, and I think that most or all of us at Rethinking Hell share this conviction, what it means is, um, among other things, it means that if the doctrine of conditional immortality or annihilationism um, were first to be taught by Christians thousand, you know, over a thousand years after uh, the time of Christ, that would be a real big red flag that this is, uh, that this is a, a novelty. It's a theological novelty, and as Edward Fudge was fond of saying, if it's new, it probably isn't true, and if it's true, it probably isn't new. Or he'll say it the other way around. I don't, I don't remember. Um, but that's really stuck with me. And so when I was first becoming convinced of conditionalism, when I was first moved to the fence and then was making my way toward becoming more and more convinced of conditionalism, um, I was not willing to come down off of that fence if I thought that the first person to teach conditional immortality was Edward Fudge. Or for that matter, somebody in the 19th century like Jacob Blaine. Or for that matter, the 4th century, like Arnobius of Sicca. If the first um, conditionalists that we could identify were not until a few hundred years after Christ, that would be, that even that would be a bit of a red flag for me personally, although not nearly as much so as if the first person that had taught it had been in the 19th century. But nevertheless, you see my point, hopefully. Um, what, what 
made me final or one of the things that made me um, finally comfortable to embrace conditionalism and self-identify as as a conditionalist is that I discovered that many of the church fathers, the earliest ones, were conditionalists. And so um, and so it's with that conviction in mind and those findings in mind uh, that I started the Conditionalists in History series on this channel many episodes ago. And uh, what I've been doing in every installment of that series is looking at another um, person in Christian history who uh, was a conditionalist, or at least appears to have been a conditionalist, given all the evidence we have available to us. And for the most part, those have included very early um, Christian writings and even a little bit of pre-Christian writings. Uh, there was one installment of the series that was a modern theologian, namely Clark Pinnock, uh, but I don't. But that's only loosely in the conditionalist history. Uh, conditionalist in history series because what I've been mostly trying to do with this series is establish um, that conditionalism was, uh, if not the only view in the earliest Christian writings, it was at the very least the most dominant one. So we're going to continue that series today, and as I have done in previous installments, uh, I'm going to go to some slides, which is good because now you don't have to look at my face anymore anyway. Hey Nick, it's good to see you. Thanks for tuning in. Um, and like I've been doing in this series, I'm going to start with a bit of a, uh, a refresher, a little bit of, just to catch people up to where, what we've looked at so far. If you have not seen any of these episodes, any of the installments of this series, I would encourage you to go back and watch them because I'm about to show you who we've covered so far. And if you question whether the people that we've covered so far were indeed conditionalists, I'll want you to go back and, um, Watch those episodes so you can see for yourself the basis for my identifying them as early conditionalists. Um, but even before we do that, I want to set the stage. As this is all I always start this series with this slide um, for the sake of people that are new to the debate, people that haven't watched this show before. See, believers in uh, uh, eternal torment do not believe merely that the lost will suffer forever in hell. It's not merely eternal torment. Um, as the Rethinking Hell, Hell Triangle helpfully demonstrates, um, this is a, a, a resource that we make available at rethinkinghell.com slash hell dash triangle. Uh, or maybe it's just hell triangle without a dash. But either way, what it helpfully illustrates, having placed each of the three major Christian views of hell at one of the points of the triangle, is that every pair of views... Uh, share something in common that the third denies. And what the doctrine of eternal torment and the doctrine of universalism share in common is a belief that when the unsaved, having previously died, are resurrected back to life, they, along with the saved, will be made bodily or physically immortal and will live bodily or physically forever. The question, according to the doctrine of eternal torment, is not who will be made immortal and live forever, but where they will live forever, having been made immortal. Um, the saved, having been raised and made immortal, will go on and live forever in the blissful presence of God and community of his people. But the lost, having been resurrected and made bodily immortal, will live physically forever in wherever hell is to experience whatever the nature of the torment is that they experience there. But it is everlasting life in immortality, in the immortality of both soul and resurrected body to which soul has been reunited. Um, and that's this also true of universalism with one exception. Universalism says those who have been raised immortal and will live forever and begin to live their everlasting life in hell will eventually, all of them, repent and be saved and continue living forever but in heaven rather than in hell. So both the doctrine of eternal torment and universalism, um, both, thank you, Peter, for pointing that out in the chat. Um, so both, both eternal torment and universalism both share belief in universal immortality or unconditional immortality or indiscriminate immortality, meaning that there are no conditions that anyone upon being raised from the dead must meet in order to be given immortality by God in soul and body. Everyone will be given it indiscriminately. And that is precisely what those two views share in common, which we conditionalists deny. Uh, unlike Eternal Torment, which says that everybody will be raised immortal and live forever, we believe only the saved will be raised immortal and live forever, and everyone else will die, literally, a second time, be destroyed, and never live or experience anything ever again. 
So, to establish this, just in case you doubt what I have said about the doctrine of eternal torment entailing the everlasting life in immortal body and soul in hell of the wicked, just survey church history. The earliest believers in eternal torment in the church that I've been able to identify include Tatian of Adiabene, writing in around 160 AD or CE. I'm, I'm in academia now, and they want us to use CE for common era instead of AD for Anno Domini. And of course, that means that instead of BC, we're supposed to say BCE before common era. So if you see CE and you're wondering why I'm not using AD, that's why. Welcome, Jean. Uh, Jean, uh, I'm, I'm assuming I'd pronounce your name Jean in Italy. Thanks for tuning in from abroad. I appreciate that. And notice that uh, Tatian of Adiabene, again, the earliest Christian believer in eternal torment that I can identify, says that uh, after we die, we will either receive the immortal with enjoyment or the painful with immortality. Writing around the same time, um, in case that wasn't clear, writing around the same time, about 15 years later, give or take, Athenagoras of Athens says, all of us will live another life, either better than the present one and heavenly, or a worse one in fire. And he quotes Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, talking about the immortal immortalization of the resurrection body. He quotes that and applies it to both the saved and the lost, which is a perversion of that text beyond belief. Uh, but even but believers in eternal torment today sometimes do it. But you see the point that I'm getting at, Athenagoras is making clear that he and Tatian are, the, the immortality that they think the lost will have when they are suffering forever in hell is immortality that comes with resurrection. So these earliest believers in eternal torment in, in the church, writing at a 160, 175 AD, are saying the lost, like the saved, will be resurrected immortal in body and soul and live forever. It's just where where will they live it? And this this belief in the immortalization and everlasting embodied life of the wicked is continued to be affirmed all throughout church history by believers in eternal torment. So a few hundred years later, Augustine of Hippo, a believer in eternal torment, says, now the human spirit or soul cannot die, meaning it is immortal. And he says that, that capacity of immortality currently only enjoyed by the soul will one day be in the bodies of even the damned. Fast forward 1,300 years to the Great Awakening, and Jonathan Edwards says that the resurrected lost, uh, he says of the resurrected lost, that their bodies will be immortal. <laughs> and, and, he, and he outright, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm close to calling this a lie, but I'll just say a grievous error. He says, he says, the righteous are no more in the very words, I'm assuming of scripture, said to be immortal in happiness that the wicked are said to be immortal in misery. Uh, no, it does not. The, the very words of scripture do not say that. That's an outright, it seems like an outright lie. What he must mean is something like, it can be no less inferred from Scripture that the uh, that the righteous will be immortal in happiness than that the wicked will be immortal in misery. But that's not what he said. I hope that's what he meant. That'd be the only way to um, make it not a lie. But that having been said, the point is just that this that this tradition affirmed by Tatian and Athenagoras in the second century and repeated by Augustine of Hippo in the fifth century, and of course uh, uh, five hundred years later in the Scholastic period, affirmed by Thomas Aquinas and others here in the Great Awakening is still continued and then even into the modern day Robert Peterson in debate with Edward Fudge says the lost will be immortal in body and soul John MacArthur and John Piper and a host of other traditionalists affirm that the resurrected lost will live forever so there's really no question here if you are doubtful that I'm I can't count I, I can't count the number of times people including scholars who have said I've misrepresented the doctrine of eternal torment by saying that it affirms that the lost will be resurrected and made immortal even in their bodies and live forever in their bodies. But that is what the doctrine of eternal torment entails. It's what its advocates, its advocacy is probably the wrong way to put it, but its affirmers, those who've affirmed it since some Christians started affirming it, have said as much. That the resurrected lost will be immortal in body and soul and live forever. 
The reason I say all of that is just to set the stage for what we're going to see when we turn to the subject of our attention today. But before we do that, contrast what these traditionalists throughout history have said with what conditionalists say. Um, the person, uh, one of the three or four people most responsible for convincing me of conditionalism is Glenn Peoples, uh, whom I am uh, blessed to be able to call a friend. He says that immortality or endless life is a gift that God will give to those who are saved at the resurrection. It's a very different characterization of things than believers in eternal torment through church history have used. Edward Fudge, who has who passed away a few years ago, says that scripture makes it clear that God will give the redeemed immortality and incorruptibility, not the wicked. Uh, Stephen Travis, a British theologian, says that human beings are conditionally immortal. We have the possibility of becoming immortal as a gift from God. So you see the two ways that traditionalists and conditionalists talk through history. Believers in eternal torment over here uh, say the resurrected lost will be immortal in body and soul, just like the saved. They will live for physically forever, just like the saved. But conditionalists say that no, immortality and endless life are only going to be given to the saved. The lost, when they are raised, will instead be raised mortal and will literally die a second time and be destroyed. So, what we have done in our series thus far is not counting the treatment of Clark Pinnock, is we've gone through a timeline of events. Um, we began with around 30 or 33 AD at the death of Jesus, and we had at the right end of the timeline the birth of St. Augustine in 354. Um, and we went through a few episodes uh, with that timeline, but in the most recent episode of this series, we shifted a little bit. We moved the timeline back a little bit so that we could bring the distinction between B.C. and A.D. up. And so we included the birth of Jesus in 6 or 4 B.C., the founding of the Roman Empire in 27 A.D., the taking of Jerusalem by Rome in 63, those kinds of things. <laughs> Um, so this is where we're going to continue to focus, at least for this episode. And in the first installment of the series, we looked at Ignatius of Antioch, who was born in around 50 AD and died around 110 AD. He wrote as Bishop of Antioch around 100 AD. In the next installment of the series, we looked at Clement of Rome, who was Bishop of Rome from 92 or 93 AD to 99 AD. And so he was he wrote his epistle right in that time frame. The uh, next installment of the series featured the Epistle of Barnabas, written somewhere between the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD and uh, 130 AD, somewhere in that time frame. Then we looked at the Didache, the, the teaching of the apostles, which was written somewhere between 50 AD and 130 AD. Then we looked at the writing called Second Clement, which is a little bit of a misnomer. It's not really Clement of Rome. It's known as um, pseudo-Clementine literature, false Clementine literature. But nevertheless, a respected document in that time frame, written somewhere between 95 AD and 140 AD. And then I think it was at that point that we, in last episode, introduced uh, some pre-Christian writings known as the Psalms of Solomon, written somewhere between 63 and 40 BCE or BC. And then we looked at its um, uh, mis <laughs> its misleadingly, count I don't know how to put this, it it's, it's what might be considered counterpart in the Christian era, the Odes of Solomon, written somewhere between 100 and 250 AD. I say it's, 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 it's as if it's the counterpart to the Psalms of Solomon. It, it is probably written, uh, these were probably written in an attempt to continue the tradition laid down by the Psalms of Solomon, um, but, they, but they really are not, they're not written by the same, same author and they shouldn't be confused with one another. But nevertheless, that's, uh, that was what we looked at last time, was the uh, Psalms of all Solomon before Christ and the Odes of Solomon after Christ. And that brings us to our episode today, in which we're going to be looking at Polycarp of Smyrna. 
who um, was born in 69 AD and died at 155 AD or possibly 167 AD. There's a little bit of dispute there, but it doesn't really matter for the purposes of our discussion today. Now, before I tell you who uh, who uh, Polycarp of Smyrna was and why I am now convinced he's a conditionalist, I want to um, I want to explain why I have until this episode hesitated to claim Polycarp of Smyrna as a conditionalist. See, I have for some time now, even before doing some of these episodes, been claiming Ignatius of Antioch, Clement of Rome, Irenaeus of Lyon um, as early church fathers who were conditionalists. Um, and I've, I've been willing to do that because it has been really clear and there didn't seem to be any substantial um, what might be called recalcitrant evidence, evidence that seemed to challenge the conclusions I had come to. Um, so I, with all those other authors, I had very clear positive testimony from that particular church father in support of conditionalism. And then on the other side of the coin, I had no substantial challenge, as far as I can tell, to identifying those fathers as conditionalists. But up until preparing for this episode a few days ago, when I first started preparing for it, I had no, I didn't have either of those, as far as I could tell, for Polycarp of Smyrna. Um, what I had from Polycarp of Smyrna was nothing really clear, I thought. And in the meantime, I had at least one text attributed, recording words attributed to Polycarp, and which seemed like very possibly an affirmation of eternal torment. And so I've so I've been reluctant. I've been I've been holding out identifying Polycarp of Smyrna, of Smyrna as a conditionalist. And I think that what I probably would have said is that if Polycarp was indeed a believer in eternal torment, well, I, th I think what I've said is, I think what I would have said or did say is one or both of two things. Number one, if he was indeed a believer in eternal torment, he may have written, or, or because his martyrdom was in 155 AD or later, he is um, affirming eternal torment right around the same time that Athenagoras of Athens and Tatian of Adiabene are affirming eternal torment in their writings. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be as early as the other writers that we've looked at, Ignatius of Antioch, Clement of Rome, etc. Um, so that was one way I would have uh, addressed the claim of Polycarp. But the other way I addressed it is by pointing out that that text that records uh, words alleged to have been said by Polycarp was actually could not be reliably assume, could not be confidently assumed to accurately record Polycarp's words because they weren't written by that the, the words weren't written by Polycarp they were recorded uh, by people alleged to be recording his martyrdom. And the earliest text we have is from Eusebius writing uh, considerably after the death of Polycarp. And so basically I, I said, I don't know what Polycarp was. I don't think there's really great evidence he was a believer in eternal torment, but I also didn't see um, great evidence that he was a conditionalist, and so I've been reluctant. And then a few days ago I decided, I wonder if I can take another look at him and see if I can... Um, if I can come down off the fence as far as what he believed. And sure enough, what I found really kind of blew me away. And so I'm really excited to share what I'm about to share with you today. And suffice it to say that moving forward, I will confidently include Polycarp of Smyrna as one of the early conditionalists. Um, but we'll see why here as I move forward. So let's return to my PowerPoint. And let's talk about who... Um, Polycarp of Smyrna was. So there's a group of early church fathers known as the Apostolic Fathers uh, because they were um, they were writing right after the apostles themselves. They were possibly themselves disciples of the apostles in some cases. And this list of Apostolic Fathers includes Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, as well as I think the Epistle of Barnabas, the Didache, uh, and maybe one or two others. But among the Apostolic Fathers, of which there are more than three, there are three known as the Chief Apostolic Fathers. Um, they're not known as the Chief. Chief here is an adjective. They are the three foremost 
among the Apostolic Fathers. Those are Clement of Rome, whom we've looked at before and was a conditionalist. They were Ignatius of Antioch, whom we looked at before and, who, and was a conditionalist. And they were also Polycarp of Smyrna, who, as we will see shortly, was a conditionalist. He was also a disciple, at least according to tradition, according to Eusebius and, uh, and Irenaeus, um, writing not long after the martyrdom of Polycarp of Smyrna. Uh, according to them, Polycarp of Smyrna was a disciple of John the Apostle. So the very writer of the Gospel of John, and very possibly, I think so, the writer of the Book of Revelation, discipled Polycarp. And so what Polycarp has to say is an important but not infallible window into what John said both in his Gospel and in his Apocalypse. Polycarp was the Bishop of Smyrna. Smyrna was a, it may still exist, I don't know, I didn't even, I didn't even think to look, but, but at least it was um, a city near Ephesus in Asia Minor, which we know as Turkey nowadays. He knew personally and corresponded with one of those other apostolic fathers we mentioned, Ignatius of Antioch. In fact, we're going to read today a text or part of a letter that Ignatius wrote to Smyrna as part of our um, evidence we'll be looking at today. He was martyred in 155 AD. Like I said earlier, though, it could be as late as 167 AD. The debate has to do with whether the 13th and 14th, I think, chapters of his epistle were written um, uh, separately from the rest of, or sorry, of the martyrdom. Yeah, of the martyrdom, whether they, or, uh, I don't remember. Anyway, there, there's a dispute over, uh, no, I, now I remember. In in Polycarp's letter, there's a couple, of, it, there's, it seems like in most of it, he sees Ignatius as having died, but there's a little bit that sees him as having not yet died. And so that leads some scholars to think that, that the later thing was compiled with the earlier thing after, uh, after Polycarp's death. And, um, and and if that's the case, it would push his martyrdom out a little bit. But anyway, it's 155 AD, um, if not maybe 165 or 167 AD. In fact, by the way, his I think his martyrdom, the, the record of his martyrdom is the earliest Christian martyr, martyrdom that we have, uh, the earliest record of a Christian martyr that we have. He has only one surviving writing, although scholars believe he wrote more than this, and it's an epistle or a letter that he wrote to the, the church at Philippi. And as I said earlier, his alleged dying words are recorded by Eusebius in his church history. And as I mentioned, I have historically said I question how reliable Eusebius' record is. Um, but that skepticism will not come into play in what we go through today. Today, we are assuming that Eusebius records Polycarp accurately. All right. So the first of three, I think, bodies of evidence I'm going to look at have to do with texts in his epistle in which Polycarp seems to indicate that only the saved will be resurrected, at least resurrected permanently. In the second chapter of his epistle, he says, He who raised Christ up from the dead will raise up us also if we do his will. Uh, and, uh, and then he goes on from there. Uh, and the word if there is there in the Greek. Uh, aeon or heon is the Greek word. And he uses it many times throughout his epistle as a condition upon which something would be true. So those who do not do his will, according to Polycarp, would not be resurrected. In fact, and he repeats himself in chapter 5, If we please him in this present world, we shall, also, we shall receive also the future world, because he's promised to us that he will raise us up again from the dead. So again, in Polycarp's mind, resurrection, in the truest sense of the word anyway, is conditioned on doing Christ's will, being in Christ. Now, just to be clear, that does not necessarily mean that he thinks the lost won't be raised at all. In fact, I'm going to challenge that he, I'm going to argue that he didn't mean that here in a second. Um, what he may simply mean, as conditionalism teaches, uh, 
is that the lost will be raised, but only to face destruction very soon thereafter, after which it will be as if they'd never been raised at all. This is very similar to Isaiah 26, in which Isaiah says that his people will rise and live, but the lost will, but the unrighteous will not. Their oppressors will not, he says. They will not rise and live. That's not doesn't mean Isaiah's refusing that he's saying the lost won't be raised at all. It just means they won't be raised and remain that way. It's as if he's looking into the distant future beyond resurrection and the lost aren't there any longer. Only the saved are. So is that what Polycarp means? I think so, and here's why. He seems to say that a physical death and not the phys- not a normal physical death like one that might happen naturally dying in the lap of luxury and old old age no he seems to say that a um, a violent physical death is the punishment for those who don't believe he says in chapter 2 that Christ's blood the greek word is haima um, will god will require exeteo of those who do not believe in him but he who raised him up from the dead will raise up us also so notice what he's saying the those who don't believe in him god will require christ's blood from them now on its face that might not sound like all that substantial on in the in the um uh, in the context of this debate but he's but this language of exacting or requiring blood is a reference to the death penalty the Septuagint rendition of Genesis chapter 9, when after the flood, when God tells Noah that he, um, that, you know, anything, any living creature that takes the life of another will itself have its life taken from it. The, the Septuagint says that the blood, there's Haima again, of your lives, I will require, ekzeteo, at the hand of all wild beasts, and I will require, ekzeteo, the life of man at the hand of, the, of his brother man. He that sheds man's blood Instead of that blood shall his own be shed. You see, you can't shed the blood of a dead person unless you raise him first. So when you combine the fact that Polycarp thinks that only the saved will be raised and live with the fact that he says a violent bloody death is what is deserved by those who don't believe. Um... You have every reason to think that he thinks the lost will be raised and then immediately destroyed. But we're not done. That was the second line of evidence. I'm going to offer a third. Um, but this is going to come not from Polycarp's own pen. So, so far, we've, we've looked at only Polycarp's own words from his epistle, the epistle to the Philippians. But now we're going to look at what his friend Ignatius said to Polycarp. Ignatius, in his epistle to Polycarp, says, Be sober as an athlete of God. The prize set before you is immortality and eternal life, of which you, Polycarp, are also persuaded. Yes, Greg, raised up is the same Greek word as resurrect. Um, resurrect is just raised up. Literally, it means to cause, to, to stand up, to not, not, not to intransitively stand up, like, oh, I'm going to stand up, but rather, I'm going to stand you up. That's what raise up literally means. And it's the word that is translated resurrect or raised. It's, it's the same thing. Now, there's also a word, anastasis, uh, anastas, anastasis which means, or, or athanas, athanasia, which, or anast, anastasia. That's right. So, anastasia means a standing up, a resurrection. Athanas, athanasia means a immortality. There's also aftarsia, meaning incorruptibility. But the point is, yes, resurrection literally just means a standing back up again, to cause to stand back up. But anyway, notice what Ignatius is saying to his friend Polycarp. He's saying to Polycarp that you already know that the prize of being an athlete of God is immortality and eternal life. But it's not just Ignatius who seems to think that. It's also those who recorded or purport to have recorded Polycarp's own martyrdom. So in the martyrdom of Polycarp, chapter 14, Polycarp is recorded as saying, God, you have counted me worthy of the resurrection and eternal life through the incorruption imparted by the Holy Ghost. 
See, if we assume that this is indeed the words of Polycarp, Polycarp thinks immortality, that resurrect that immortality after resurrection comes through the incorruption that comes from the Holy Spirit. This is immortality and everlasting life come by being united in Christ. In the uh, in chapter 17 of the martyrdom of Polycarp, it says that Polycarp was crowned with the wreath of immortality. It's a reward. It's not a curse. It's not a reward for some and a curse for others. It's a reward, period. And then again in chapter 19, we see that he has acquired the crown of immortality. So we've got three bodies of evidence. And, and um, I appreciate your question, Red Pill Matrix. It sounds like you're a universalist. Um, that's not the topic of this episode. So um, if you want to know what we at Rethinking Hell think about universalism, you, there's a whole lot of videos on our channel you could check out, some of which have universalism in the very title. And, um, and in those episodes, I'll have answered the question you ask here. I'd like it if we stayed on topic. So there are three lines of evidence that I've here offered, and I'm not done. Number one, we looked at Polycarp's own epistle, and we see him saying that resurrection unto enduring life is only for the saved. And then secondly, we looked at his own writings, and we saw that he says a violent, bloody death is what is deserved by those who don't believe. And, and by violent, bloody death, I'm not using code language. It's it literally... Death is not here separation from God. It's literally dying a violent, bloody death, the likes of which was required after the flood of anybody who took the blood that took the life of another person. And then thirdly, we looked at Ignatius's epistle to, uh, to Polycarp, and we looked at the martyrdom of Polycarp, and we saw their continued affirmation on Polycarp's part of immortality and enduring life being gifts of God coming only to the saved. You put all three of those bodies, those those um, lines of evidence together, and you do have an extremely compelling case. But there is the other side of that coin I mentioned. So now I have what I have hitherto not had, at least not to my knowledge, which is a powerful positive case for Polycarp being a conditionalist. So I got that. Great. But there's still the other side of the coin that I mentioned earlier. There was, there was still an argument... And you, you, you do it, if you look up church fathers on hell or something like that in Google, and I guarantee you will find several resources, including ones from people I respect and admire, um, like uh, J. Warner Wallace, attribute or quoting the martyrdom of Polycarp and saying, "See, look, Polycarp was a believer in eternal torment." And when I and up until preparing for this episode, I looked at that text and scratched my head and didn't know what to make of it. Um, but now I do, and it's astonishing. At least it is to me. Maybe, maybe you know. Look, look. I'm biased. I'm, I'm looking. I'll, I'll be the first to admit. I am looking for. Uh, sorry, I got distracted by Nick's um, off-topic question. I'm not a big fan of wings. I, I, uh, I, I don't know if I would count them wings or not. And frankly, I could give. It, I, I don't care. <laughs> All right. Um, so anyway, so I'm, I'm biased and I am looking for an explanation for what Polycarp is purported to have said according to this, um, uh, according to this martyrdom of Polycarp. So take what I say with a grain of salt, but consider what I have to say. Because at the very least, I think what I can demonstrate is that the texts thought to teach eternal torment um, on uh, or the, the 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 text thought to indicate Polycarp believed in eternal torment have an equally plausible alternative reading, but I'm going to argue it's actually the better reading. So let's dig into that. There are two texts in the mar martyrdom of Polycarp that believers in eternal torment cite as support for saying that Polycarp believed in eternal torment. One of them is in the martyrdom of Polycarp, chapter two. The author says that looking to the grace of Christ, martyrs despised all the torments of this world, redeeming themselves from eternal punishment by a single hour, by the torments of a single hour. For this reason, the fire of their savage executioners appeared cool to them, for they kept before their view escape from that fire which is eternal and shall never be quenched. So you can see eternal punishment, eternal fire, unquenchable fire. 
No, Susan J. Warner Wallace is a traditionalist. But in his articles where he tries to defend eternal torment against people like me, he cites Polycarp as early church support for eternal torment. So, according to the martyrdom of Polycarp, uh, the people that recorded Polycarp's martyrdom believed in eternal punishment, eternal fire, shall never be quenched. They uh, Believers in eternal torment think all of this is just eternal torment language. But anybody familiar with the debate knows that's not. <laughs> See, we conditionalists um, agree that the Bible teaches eternal punishment and eternal fire and unquenchable fire. But we think all of those expressions are biblical phrases that support conditionalism. Eternal punishment is contrasted with eternal life. So eternal punishment must be death forever. Eternal fire in Matthew 18, 8 and 9 is parallel to Gehenna of fire, the Old Testament valley of the sons of Hinnom, which Jeremiah promised in Jeremiah chapter 7 will become the valley of slaughter in which the corpses of God's slain enemies are consumed. It's also the fire that came down from heaven and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, killing its inhabitants, according to Jude. An unquenchable fire is fire that burns up, katakayo, chaff, according to John the Baptist and Jesus himself in Matthew 13. So these are biblical expressions that we conditionalists think teach our view. And all the author is saying is that by standing firm throughout temporary pain, and the word torments is basana, it's the, it's the noun form of, or a noun form of basanizo, meaning to torment. By standing firm throughout temporary pain, again, Red Pill Matrix, this is not the topic of today's episode. Thank you. So anyway, what the authors of this martyrdom are saying is that by standing firm through temporary pain, and the word is torment there, martyrs avoid eternal punishment. But it's a different word. It's the same word used in Matthew 25, 46. Colossus, meaning punishment. Punishment can be torment, but it can also be death. So, so the martyrdom of Polycarp chapter 2 doesn't help the traditionalist at all. We conditionalists absolutely could say and do say the exact same thing. We, we would happily, or at least we'd like to think, we would happily suffer for a period of time under persecution in order to avoid uh, eternal punishment that is capital, eternal, eternal capital punishment, right? Um, Susan, you're, you're welcome to exchange, you're, you're welcome to interact with the universalist who wants to discuss off topic topics here. Um, but I won't be paying attention to it anymore. Um, so we don't have support for eternal torment from chapter two, but what about chapter 11? This is the text that up until preparing for this episode, uh, I didn't know what to make of. And it did seem at, at first glance as if it was an affirmation of eternal torment. So the proconsul is recorded as saying to Polycarp, I will cause you to be consumed by fire. But Polycarp said in response, you threaten me with fire which burns for an hour and after a little while is extinguished. But you're ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment and of eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. Now you can see what it sounds like um, Polycarp is saying, according to the record of his, mar of his martyrdom. It sounds like what he's saying is, you, proconsul, are threatening, to, threatening me with a fire which might cause me pain for an hour, but then will end. But what you're ignorant of, Mr. Proconsul, is a fire that is everlasting. So, whereas your fire torments me for an hour, it will torment you for eternity. Right? It does indeed sound like that is what he is saying. Um, what ha The reason why I didn't outright see it as proof of eternal torment on Polycarp's part, though, was because um, nobody s experiences pain on a funeral pyre, on a pyre, a, a big pile of sticks, and, and, and they're tied to a stake in it, and they set it on fire. Nobody is burned experiencing pain for an hour in that fire before they die. 
Um, I, I'll confess, I don't know how long it takes to burn to death in you know, being tied to a stake and having a pile of wood beneath your feet lit ablaze. But I'm fa I was fairly certain, and I am fairly certain, it doesn't take you're, you're not in excruciating burning pain for an hour. <laughs> I get so sick and frickin' tired of universalists pretending as though universalism and universal reconciliation are two different things. They're not. They're just two different phrases for the same thing. Anyway. So, what my suspicion was, was that what Polycarp was actually doing was using fire as a metaphor. You threaten me with fire, which brings about death, but that death... Is as if will last as if only for an hour, but the punishment that is waiting for you, but, but well, but, but then will be extinguished by resurrection. But you, proconsul, you are what is waiting you is an eternal punishment of death. So I thought I thought maybe what Polycarp was doing was using the fire uh, that the Polycarp was threatening him with as a metaphor for a temporary period of time being dead after which God would raise him from the dead and then kill the proconsul who would remain dead forever thereafter. Um, but I was not at all confident of that reading, and I, and I am now inclined away from that reading. But as it turns out, being inclined away from that reading inclines me toward what I think is a better reading, and a better reading than even the Eternal Torment reading, a reading that squarely puts Polycarp in the conditionalist side of the debate. So let's take a closer look. Um, what I'm about to try to demonstrate is that Polycarp's defiant response to the proconsul reflects his understanding that the proconsul's fire is resistible and impotent, whereas God's fire, his fiery judgment on the last day, will not be resistible and will not be impotent. His response really has nothing at all to do with how long a fire burns or how long it inflicts pain. So why do I say this? Well, if we look a little closer, that that record in, or that this chapter of the martyrdom has the proconsul saying, "I will cause you to be consumed by fire." Dapanao is the word to devour, to consume. And Polycarp says, well, the fire you threaten me with will only burn for an hour and then will be extinguished. Spenu me. All right. Now watch this. After he gives this defiant response, um, and you can go read this for yourself. Uh, first, the proconsul says, actually, I'm going to throw you to the beasts instead. But then Philip is like, no, he can't be thrown to the beasts. And there's a reason for it. I can't remember what it was. So instead, the proconsul um, uh, ties him to a stack of to a, you know to a stack of wood to burn him to death and he and then polycarp prays and then the the thing is lit on fire and the record uh whether you believe it or not says that the fire did some really bizarre stuff um and among the bizarre stuff it did polycarp according to chapters 15 and 16 of the martyrdom says polycarp appeared within the fire which was doing weird stuff but not like flesh was just burnt he, he was not being affected negatively harmed by that fire he polycarp appeared within not like flesh which is burnt and then it goes on to say that when those wicked men perceived that his body could not be consumed dapanao by the fire they commanded an executioner why because Polycarp hadn't been killed. He was being protected from the fire. They commanded an executioner to go near and pierce him through with a dagger. And on his doing this, on the executioner's doing this, there came forth from, uh, from Polycarp a great quantity of blood so that the fire was extinguished. Are you starting to see what's going on here? The proconsul had threatened Polycarp with a fire he intended to consume Polycarp to kill him and to burn his body up but Polycarp says that after your fire burns for an hour it'll do, it'll be extinguished and sure enough what happens 
just a few chapters later in the record, whether we're to believe it or not, of um, his martyrdom, the fire does not consume him. He survives it. He is not consumed by the fire. And so an executioner has to go and pierce him through with a dagger. And as a result of being stabbed, a huge quantity of blood. By the way, if you get stabbed, no amount of blood will come out of your body that is sufficient to put out a fire. This is supernatural. So God protected um, Mar uh, Polycarp from the fire and then allows the executioner to end his life supernaturally allowing a great deal of flood to come out and um, quench, extinguish that fire. See, here's the point. Con in context, in, in, the own, in the writer's flow of thought, the writers of the martyrdom of Polycarp, the proconsul's threat proved resistible and impotent, just like Polycarp said it would be. The, prong, the proconsul was not, with his puny, mortal, mortal started fire, was not able to kill Polycarp and consume his body. And after the fire burned for some time without harming Polycarp, only then did God permit Polycarp to be stabbed and killed. So God is the one who supernaturally extinguished the puny, mortal proconsul's fire. See, the proconsul's fire was not unquenchable. It was quenchable, and God quenched it after proving that it was impotent. But God's judgment fire, by contrast, will not be resistible because not being extinguished, it will destroy the risen wicked. That is the point of Polycarp's words in the martyrdom of Polycarp. There's, you, I mean, just go back and look for yourself. There's nothing here that absolutely clearly indisputably makes clear that polycarp is worried about being tormented and or not worried he envisions being tormented in fire for an hour but then his torment will come to an end and he and, and allegedly he's contrasting that with um uh with an eternal fire that will torment wicked forever no that's not there that's not what he's saying. You have to read that into this text. But if you let the uh, the flow of the of the text um, dictate your reading of it, what Polycarp is saying is that the proconsul's fire is puny mortal fire. It won't consume him, and it will be extinguished. But God's fire will not be extinguished, and so will consume. It will destroy the risen wicked. So, <laughs> far from challenging, far from um, being a believer in eternal torment and being support for early belief in early Christian belief in eternal torment, Polycarp proves upon closer examination to be much better support for conditional immortality for four reasons. Number one, because he says resurrection is only for the saved. Number two, he says, a violent, bloody death is what awaits the ungodly. Number three, those who knew him and those who recorded his martyrdom said that immortality and eternal life, uh, immortality and everlasting life are gifts given to the saved alone. And number four, in the very text alleged to indicate that Polycarp believed in eternal torment, um, well, not only... <laughs> Not only does it not support eternal torment, but it seems to indicate that God's fire will indeed consume, devour, destroy the wicked. That's a powerful case. And that's why from now on, I will claim Polycarp confidently as an early conditionalist. So let's look at our terrain one last, one last time before we wrap up this episode. Here's roughly the time frame we've been looking at. Um... We've looked at the time frame from 63 to 40 BC, and we've looked at the time frame from 50 to 250. You can see by the yellow gradient that the densest yellow is right around here between 70 and 95 AD. That's because the, the, the fathers that we've been looking at have been most densely concentrated in that period of time. And what we found as we've explored this time thus far is that 
Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, Second Clement, the Didache, the Epistle of Barnabas, the Psalms of Solomon, and the later Odes of Solomon all reflect belief in conditional immortality in this time frame. And to that list, we can now also add Polycarp of Smyrna. This is astonishing. The earliest post-New Testament Christian writings we have, spanning cities, spanning geographical areas, from various authors, some of them um, authentic, some of them pseudonymous, from all throughout this time period, a firm belief in conditional immortality and annihilationism. And it's not until over here when Origen of Alexandria and Clement of Alexandria teach universalism, and Athenagoras of Athens and Tatian of Adiabene teach eternal torment. We have conditionalism on the coming from the pens of people that were trained by the apostles themselves. We have conditionalism from the pen of the people they discipled all throughout this time period. And it's not until 165 AD or later that both eternal torment and universalism appear. It's astonishing. Astonishing. When, when I first began looking into this debate, um, yeah, Peter says, welcome home, Polycarp. Amen. I, when, when I first started uh, exploring this topic over 10 years ago, um, like I said, I was not comfortable coming down off the fence and embracing conditional immortality uh, without, if I thought that Arnobius of Sicca in the 300s was the first to teach conditional immortality. At that point, I knew he was at least a conditionalist, but he's also he also wrote some really weird stuff too that is highly dubious. So Arnobius wouldn't have, wouldn't have done it for me. But as I explored the topic, it's over the 10 years since, as I've explored these writings of these church fathers, yeah, well said, Joshua. It's it's Polycarp who's welcoming us home. That's right. Um, so what I found as I've explored the church fathers over the past over ten years, and look, I'm not a hist I'm not a historical theologian. I'm I'm trying to make the best tools I have as a as an exegete, as a trained exegete. Right? I'm looking at the original languages. I'm I'm looking at the what, what they say in their context. And I'm trying to also do a little bit of historical theology by, I mean, you have to do a little bit of historical theology to, to get access to, to know how to access the original languages with which these church fathers wrote and so forth. So I'm, I'm doing a little bit of historical theology, but I'm by no means a historical theologian. I'm an exegete. As it happens, though, the tools, with, the tools that are given to a trained exegete are tools that work really well for understanding what the church fathers wrote. And what I've, and, but but nevertheless, I'm not a historical theologian, so take what I say with a grain of salt. But as I do, as I explored these over the past ten years, I've been over and over and over again shocked and amazed and encouraged to find out not not only was my view one of the, the the views of hell that was extant in the time of the church fathers. We people have known that for some time. By the time of um, by the by, the third century A.D., you had eternal torment, like I said, the, on the likes of uh, in the likes of Tatian and Athenagoras. You had universalism in the likes of Origen and Clement of Alexandria, and and then I knew we eventually got Arnobius of Sicca for conditionalism. But uh, but not only did we have conditionalism alive and well among the early church, as every as I look at more and more of these church fathers, one by one by one by one by one, they end up actually proving to have been conditionalists. Again, this is... <laughs> Sorry, I, I went to the wrong thing there. Um, look at this. This is astonishing. The fact that prior to 165 AD... Uh, yes, Stephanie, please email me live at rethinkinghell.com or chrisdate at rethinkinghell.com or chris at chrisdate.info. Any of those emails. Find me on Facebook and send me a Facebook message. Yes, I would love um, to 
talk to a historian about this. Whether or not they'd have it come on the show, I don't know. I'd want to talk to them first, but I'd love for you to put me in contact with them. But anyway, yeah, look at this. It's just, it's just, it's amazing. Tatian and Adiabene, uh, sorry, Tatian of Adiabene and Athenagoras of Athens teaching eternal torment, and Clement and Origen of Alexandria teaching universalism don't appear until 165 AD or after, prior to which everyone we've looked at so far, all those pictures, correspond to church fathers who taught conditional immortality. That is, that is astonishing. So what do we, uh, uh, my friend Jerry Walls, professor at Houston Baptist University, a believer in eternal torment, but a very weird form of it. He has said, um, we conditionalists need to come up with an error theory, some way of explaining how eternal torment became the dominant view. Um, and I think that is still work we conditionalists need to do, but we have we have some plausible explanations worth exploring, like um, the entrance into Christianity of converts coming from Platonism and Manichaeism and other pagan worldviews. I think we can explain that. I think what the believer in eternal torment has to explain, however, um, and I don't know how I don't know how they're going to do it. And it's not just believers in eternal, eternal, eternal torment. It's universalists too. What they have to explain is why the why Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, Second Clement, the Didache, the Epistle of Barnabas, and Poly, Polycarp of Smyrna, not to mention Irenaeus of Lyon, who we haven't looked at yet, not to mention Theophilus of Antioch, who we haven't lately looked at. How is it that all these earliest church fathers? Some of them taught by the disciples themselves of Christ. Yes, Joshua, Augustine was originally Manichaean. They have to explain, both believers in eternal torment and universalists, how all of these church fathers coming out uh, from the time of the apostles, how it is that they affirm conditional immortality. Uh, I know you're not... Okay, th thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate that. Um, th they're going to have to explain how all these p people that we have from the first and second, uh, first half, first uh, the the end of the first century and the beginning of the second century, they all teach conditional immortality, and then all of a sudden, in the latter half of the second century, eternal torment and universalism appear. That, I think, is what needs explanation, not from we conditionalists, but from those people who think we should believe those traditionalists when everybody before them taught our view why would we do that so i'm i'm not going to i'm not going to allow myself to be put uh, pushed on the uh, put on my heels um i'm not going to but yeah i'm not going to allow myself to be put on my heels uh for um in this debate when it comes to historical theology sure i i absolutely have to acknowledge the fact that from about the time of augustine to the, the present day my view is an extreme minority. And um, and furthermore, we have to uh, we have to admit that from about the time of a little after Augustine to roughly the the time of the Reformation, our view has evidently no recorded believers in it. Yeah, that we we I, we have to we have to account for that. But that's not as hard to account for as the fact that the earliest Christians at the tail end of the first century and throughout the first half of the second century were all conditionalists and eternal torment and universalism don't appear until 160 AD or later. That, I'm going to start putting, I'm going to start putting <laughs> uh, believers in eternal torment on their heels um, instead of letting myself be put on my heels. So I hope this has been helpful. Um, uh, you know, I'm getting questions that are off topic about uh, apostolic tradition and the Eucharist and baptismal regeneration. They're, they're off topic. Um, I have not in any way, shape, or form cited these early church fathers as authorities. I've simply used them to demonstrate that, um, uh, that our view is by no means novel, that the earliest Christians believed it to a T, it seems, and that eternal torment and universalism are the novelties. So... Hope this has been helpful. I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do in the next episode of Rethinking How Live, but come back in two weeks' time for it, if you like. Um, it'll be Monday, May 23rd, 6 p.m. Pacific, as per usual. 
And in the meantime, like I said, if you've enjoyed this episode, please do click that like and thumbs up button. Um, subscribe to the channel. Click the notifications bell. And if you've watched until now, thank you. That helps our algorithm. Um, and we'd very much appreciate your continued support. So um, if I see you again in two weeks, I'll, I'll see you then. And um, take care until then. Bye-bye. Man, oh, look, maybe we should rethink this whole thing. I mean, I mean you heard the guy. Pains of eternal torment. Yeah, I gotta rethink this whole thing.